John. Um, thank you for naming that the old is always present in the now. Um, as much as today is about building a better future, it is also about confronting a present and a past. So thank you for kicking us off in this way. Now we're going to move um, into a conversation between Dorothy Santos and Xing Xing. Welcome Dorothy and Xing, I'm so excited for this. Hello. Um, I, I will give a visual description of myself. Um, this is Xing. I have short asymmetrical um, yellow greenish hair and I am a um, light yellow skinned East Asian female, um, non-binary, and I am inside a sunny white room with a window and a AC <laughs> and also a big plant. Um, and I'm, I'm currently um, wearing a, a, a dark gray shirt and a um, apron, a gray apron over it. Hello everyone. I'm Dorothy Santos. I have short black, well, there's few gray hairs in the front on my, on my temples. I wear clear glasses. Um, I am a Filipino American human being, brown skin. I have an opal nose ring. Um, that's my birth one, by the way. And I have a denim top. And no, absolutely, I'm not wearing house slippers. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking to you, Shin. Me too. I'm so excited to talk to you about this project in particular. Um, since Dorothy and I, we, we really started talking about this project from the very start, or even before the project even started, <laughs> um, in the sense of, I, I, feel, I feel like thinking about consent and thinking about boundaries and thinking about community building has, has just always been a part of um, our conversations and the work that we've done together through processing foundation and, and organizing work. Yeah, I, you know, well, listening to, to Joan's talk, I think we were kind of jotting down a few things that resonated with us. And one of the things that she mentioned was um, the old is always embedded in the now and how you know, even mentioning word. And when I used to work in biotech and how word was used, I, I mean, even, even when Google Docs was introduced, nobody wanted to use it because they were so scared of the, the surveillance. And well, what if, you know, pr what if people get a hold of proprietary information such as, oh, I don't know, an ICF template. <laughs> we, we should talk about this actually, because I, I um, you know, I, I, I'm, I like to see myself as a bit of an archivist in, in the jobs that I've done. And, um, and yeah, and your project just captivated me from the moment that I learned about it because I have been really fixated on consents for a long time, but in a different way, you know, um, through the biotechnological and what is asked of us when we become subjects of a trial, um, because it's very different from being a patient. I think a lot of people don't realize that when you are a subject of a trial, you're actually not, you're not, the language is very specific. They actually don't want you to call the subjects patients. So it's even the wording is very fascinating around how, when you're thinking about informed consent and also the, the, the readability and legibility of an informed consent in science is very different than say a consent you might read for like a waiver for showing your image, for instance. But yeah, I, I kind of wanted to talk about that with you regarding um, the varying tiers of TogetherNet, you know, because you have, you know, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because, you know, I, I see consent in such a rigid way. And even after talking to you initially about TogetherNet, I was just like, wow, I'm thinking too rigidly about consent maybe. Um, I, I have to say, I don't have all the answers <laughs> and, you know, I think for me, um, this, this has been a continuous learning process, right? And I think, I think speaking about consent or, or maybe more so it's, it's difficult to figure out a kind of like one size fits all model of consent, 
um, just because it, it is so specific about who the community is, who is speaking to who, who is um, taking data from whom, right? So, so I think for me though, um, the starting point of curiosity, of like connecting back to what you were saying has, has been, has started with and continued to be about language for me. And, and I think that comes from a, a very intimate experience of, you know, having gone through a period of time where I was very dedicated and still am into, you know, thinking about cybersecurity and, you know, going to like crypto parties and <laughs> like learning all the gadgets, like how do you do it um, to, to stay secure, but then also like grown to like become really interested in, in providing these kind of workshops and this kind of um, info sharing to to people who are close to me, which you know a lot of a lot of them are immigrant communities, particularly you know older and you know cross generational, and and so so it's it's only you know that at that point in time where I I kind of hit a wall, <laughs> right? Because because you know it, when I I actually did I I tried to explain or gave a workshop to my mom and her friends and and I couldn't retain their attention for like three minutes, <laughs> you know, and and that that language of cybersecurity sort of, you know, puts, puts you against the wall at every single turn if you're not already part of um, a kind of like institutional circle or have some kind of previous um, engagement or community who's very deeply involved um, with um, digital awareness or technology. So so I think I think that that is the past that is present for me <laughs> in this project and in this journey, um, in the sense of like how how do we break break down language, especially um, if we want to use integrate um, layers of protocols and of frameworks that are meant to be secure. Um, but but then you know like there's a difference between like being a software developer, implementing that and knowing that, oh, I, I know this works. <laughs> and and like, you know, on the on the front end, sort of telling people that this is this is traceless. This is <laughs> this is absolutely secure. Uh, versus trying to communicate, trying to translate that language um, of, of the security protocols into something that, you know, um, at to the level of like accessibility of journalism, for example. So so that's something that I'm very interested in. I think, oh, I, I, think lost for a I think it froze for a moment, but I think you're back. What, wait, can you say the last bit because I lost you for a second and cut out? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I think, um, I think part of, hmm, part of, part of the goal for me is trying to figure out how to bring, how to translate this, the cybersecurity terminologies, right? Like of like, peer-to-peer -peer protocol and it's like what is that and try to see how, how do we translate that into a language that is going to be welcoming and become accessible to more people and and so it's it's been a really interesting journey um, because at first you know I, I think I was like thinking about how do we bring it bring it down to a level of like say the ex the accessibility of like journalism language um, but then I think I think that became not enough as well <laughs> to a certain point, you know, and, and it has to become poetic. It has, I have to like begin to like borrow metaphors and bor bor borrow poetry into this, which, which was a very exciting turn, you know, but then also this kind of very fine balancing of making sure not overly romanticizing, <laughs> you know, like still, still communicating in a clear way. Okay, my mind's going, uh all just everywhere and so I need to rein it in because one of the things I wanted to respond to was um you know language obviously and I, I totally understand I hear you when you say trying to introduce this particular project to your mom and, and her friends and that there's a type of uh, again legibility to it and when I think of uh consent one of the things I go back to related to what you were saying was literacy um, I'm not sure if this has changed. It probably hasn't changed too terribly much, but when I was in biotech, informed consents had to be, the standard was seventh grade reading level. 
So you actually had to write an informed consent so that a seventh grader could read it. Uh, that's different probably now, especially with the pandemic, there are different considerations. Um, the, actually, because I actually signed up, because I do, everyone always asks me, why do you do 23andMe and all that? It's really for research purposes. <laughs> and I did actually sign up for um, a COVID trial. So I am technically an ongoing subject and a lot of it was admittedly so I could read the consents. Uh, they're a lot shorter. They are, there's far more bullet points in them. Um, and uh, there's a lot of fine detail that I think, well, I think is very important. I believe it's very important, but I wonder if people read it. Such as, you know, did you know that you actually would be recorded if you are on a telehealth call? So if we're, if you are meeting with a physician on Zoom, you know, an informed consent actually includes that language. And so, you know, to, I think of TogetherNet and, um, you know, I actually wrote to you yesterday about this, but I, I, I know, I don't think you've, you've gotten to my missive yet, but it's about, you know, some of my feelings around how we think about um, also communication, like what it means to, to kind of uh, use platforms in tandem with maybe um, our, our spoken, like spoken uh, word, you know, and what does it mean to kind of have speech, but then supplement it with the language of together net. And um, I remember when you first told me about the book, what is it? Uh, freedom is a endless meeting. And I think I got the title of that correct. And I remember my first visceral reaction was like, oh my gosh, that doesn't sound like freedom to me. <laughs> and then I started kind of skimming the book and realizing, oh, this is actually a really, I can see why the title is, the, the book is named as such, but I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the three tiers of how people would meet on TogetherNet. So you have kind of egalitarian, you have facilitation, you know, and I, I'm kind of wondering how, you know, and, and the scenarios, I really love the scenarios, you know, you're sitting at the park and then you, you know, are meeting with a friend. It's very casual. There's something informal. And I think that there is an air about that when it comes to TogetherNet. And I, one of the things I really love before you, before you answer is this, uh, this idea that a platform can actually um, be not only poetic, but it's a thought and social experiment. You know, I really love that from, from the start that this was something that you had intended. And, you know, you should also congratulations. I didn't say that personally to you, so congratulations. Um, I look forward to the workshop later on. But yeah, if you could talk a little bit more about those tiers. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> so maybe um, I'll talk about I'll talk about the um, the sitting at a park <laughs> language first, or address that first, if that's okay. Because um, so so what what Dorothy is referring to right now is is this process of trying to figure out. You know how how do how do I or how do we you know if if I may say translate um, security protocols and security conditions that's set up and created through network protocols into something that you know like anyone without these prior technical knowledge can can sort of like ease into. So, so what, um, what we ended up with, and actually I need to like highlight um, Nema Gidere, who is the lead writer on this project and has done amazing work um, on how to push this further and really refine the language. And it's beautiful now, I'm so happy about it. Um, is the idea, the idea is, is that, oh, maybe, maybe instead of saying that this runs on peer-to-peer -peer web RTC protocol, we can find a set of privacy scenarios in, in IRL, in physical spaces, that, that we can all more or less, like people who live um, you know, in the U U US, I'm still, I'm still thinking in this frame right now, that's the culture and frame I'm thinking within, um, can, can relate to. So, so basically the peer-to-peer -peer and security protocols translated and became um, a, a metaphor and a scenario of like sitting at a park. So when you enter the software, it would describe to you that you and a friend are sitting at a park right now and you're talking among each other, um, except if someone wants to, you know, intentionally listen in, they still can. So, so that's, and that's, that 
pretty much reflect the reality of that, right? Because network is always ephemeral, it's always leaking, it's never, um, it's never fully solid, it's never contained, right? So, so it's, it's, it's a process of trying to figure out how, so how do you translate these things without going into like all the technical details into something that can be, you know, <laughs> just, just sort of like easing to. And so, so that, that was um, a very beautiful process for myself to, to kind of like go through that and think, think through that um, in a hard way. And about the tears, um, so inside the, you know, what we what we were calling the ephemeral channel, where your messages communicated through the peer-to-peer -peer protocols are ephemeral, meaning that once the last person inside the session leave, closes their browser, um, all the messages disappear because the messages are communicated from browser to browser and doesn't go through a server. So nothing is being saved besides on people's browsers. Um, so within that mode, there are three different meeting modes. Um, so there is egalitarian, there is um, facilitated, and there's also feedback, feedback mode. So um, I think I think I'm really, I think these, you know, in a way, these three different modes of meeting um, really sort of like personally, it's, it's are the ones I personally resonate with because I have definitely, you know, being in meetings or being in communities that sort of declare themselves as horizontal and flat and know very well that it is not, <laughs> right? And, and there's always power structure and power dynamic that's introduced just, just simply by, you know, being, being in the world and being part of the society. And, and so I think, I think that egalitarian mode, um, a lot of times like reflect like the kind of like 90s chat room, which is like absolutely not very consentful, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that, those are like scenarios where boundaries are constantly crossed and conversation are extremely casual. Um, it is still included as part of the mode after our conversations, actually, because, you know, remember, I don't remember, like we had a phone call, I was like, should I still include that? Like, is it just not? helpful. And I remember you said that, oh, it can be really interesting to have people compare and actually having to choose, <laughs> you know, between egalitarian mode where there's basically no sort of superstructure of like facilitation versus like a facilitated mode where there is a, you know, facilitator <laughs> and there's actually one to three facilitator. That's kind of details I don't have to get into right now. Um, and you can like practice, um, majority rule, meaning like you can like vote on things. And you can also the, the facilitator can also basically guide conversation by using the amplify feature, another beautiful name that um, Neymar came up with. And so yeah, so it's it's really like a reflection on thinking about, you know, um, guided conversations and guided meeting versus ones that isn't. Um, the feedback mode is one where you can give secondary responses. And this maybe, you know, personally reflect, it's, it's like a deep reflection for me on like a lot of meetings where, you know, I might feel hesitant or I might disagree with something that's being said, but feel pressured not to feel pressure to have to pick my own battles, right? <laughs> it's like it's like in these in, in, in meetings uh, where something has to be done, one often is put into a position of having to pick their battles. And I think that mode for me is very much questioning that or wondering, is there another way <laughs> to, to give secondary response where things could have done gone differently? This, is that, you, that was that was just perfect. Stellar. That was amazing. And it's such great timing, actually, because I can't believe we have already run out of time. And I think the last thing I'll say, which I think is so perfect, even though Maggie Nelson means it in the in the romantic way, and I am a hopeful romantic, even about technology um, <laughs> and um, how we can uh, kind of wield our own individual embodied power. Um, in, in lurking behind and looking at the interfaces, you know, she talks about, and this is so apropos for TogetherNet, she talks about um, an infinite conversation and an endless becoming, which I think is so perfect to end our conversation, which I know is an infinite conversation between the two of us. So thank you so much for just TogetherNet and for the team and 
that work so hard on it. And um, I'm just so excited for it to be out in the world. Thank you, Dorothy.